All right, wonderful folks. We'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Don Bardot, and I'm your host for today's session, our MDICX series, The Case for Medical Device Interoperability Toward a Future of Patient-Centered Care. I'll start by talking to you a little bit about MDIC and how we'll conduct today's webinar, and then we'll move on to our three speakers. We have FDA draft guidance for interoperable medical devices presented by Bakul Patel from the FDA CDRH, the Associate Center Director for Digital Health. Safe medical devices interoperability to enable healthcare transformation will be presented by Julian Goldman from the Medical Device Interoperability Program. He's the Director at Partners Health Biomedical Engineering and Biomedical Director at Massachusetts General Hospital, a medical doctor and an anesthesiologist. And we'll wrap up with a third speaker from the Center of Medical Device Interoperability. He'll give an overview of that center and the aim. Mr. Ad Cantwell, the Executive Director for the Center for Medical Device Interoperability. Today we'll have a three speaker presentation followed by a question and answer period. The question and answers will be typed in in the Q&A box on the right hand side. So anytime throughout today's presentation, feel free to go ahead and ask your question. At the end of the three presentations, as a panel session, I will moderate and ask those questions to our speakers. And the audience is free at any time to add additional questions into that Q&A box. Please address the Q&A to all panelists. Additionally today, for the first time, we'll be offering a interactive uh, survey. And this anonymous interactive survey is to help gauge our viewers' interest in interoperability, current state of interoperability, and help guide thoughts in the question and answer session. So that we all understand how our survey mechanism works, we have a pre-survey on the right-hand side. If you'll go ahead and fill that out now, it's a short three questions. And at the end of those three questions, Paul Wisher from MDIC, who's helping to facilitate today's webinar, will close the poll and you'll immediately be able to see the results. That'll give you a flavor of how this survey mechanism will work. And then we'll start a second survey that'll be open during all three presenters' talks and we'll close it just before the Q&A and you'll be able to see those results. All the questions and answers are anonymous and will help form MDIC's thinking as we look to build that case for interoperability. Feel free to go ahead and start answering those questions now for this pre-survey. We'll close the pre-survey after I'm done speaking, which will be in two slides. And Paul, if you'll go ahead and advance this next slide. MDIC is a public-private partnership and we collaborate on regulatory science to expedite access of new medical technologies to patients safer, faster, and more cost-effectively. We work through our membership to identify projects where we can make impact in the ecosystem and we bring our resources to bear to conduct those projects. We're a membership-led organization and then we seek additional funding through project-based work through grants and contracts. By being a public-private partnership between industry, the FDA, CMS, NIH, and nonprofits, including patient groups, providers, and academics, we're able to make progress and advance regulatory science. Next slide, please, Paul. So today's speakers once again, and we'll go in this order, starting with Bakul Patel, followed by Julian Goldman, and finishing with Ed Cantwell. Question and answers will be after all three presenters finish for the day. Additionally, we'll have this poll, the survey that's open throughout the three speakers' time talking. You can take your time to answer that survey and then we'll show you the results at the end of today's session. Additionally, we'll post the survey results on our website, mdic.org, a few days after today's session concludes. As our pre-survey uh, concludes, we'll show you what the results look like from that pre-survey just before we enter into our first speaker's presentation. So on the right-hand side, you can see that poll. It has a series of three questions. They give you the spectrum of the types of three questions we'll have. 
yes or no is the first question, the answer that can be selected. The second one is free text, where you can type in a short answer, a little bit longer than Twitter, but not too much longer. And then a third type, which is multi-select, and you can check any of the boxes that you would like to check. Please try this practice poll now. And as a reminder, we'll take Q&A through the text box, labeled Q&A. You can see a picture of what it looks like. Mine right now is um, the arrow it has contracted the Q&A poll, and if I click on the Q&A, it'll expand that. So you can try that on your own interface, and you'll want to address your questions to all panelists, and then press send. I will moderate at the end of the three presentations and ask these questions to our panelists. And so, Paul, if at this time you'll go ahead and give the audience maybe 10 seconds and then close this poll, everybody can see how their answers appear on the screen from this anonymous poll. And I just finished submitting my results. So if we can, with poll has ended, and then Paul is going to display the results to everybody so that we can see them. Wonderful, thank you, Paul. So we can see that we have about a third of the audience saying they're MDIC members, a little over a third saying they're not, and a third that did not respond. We had one response that we can see to the, well, I can see my response to the, um, the free text answer. You all will see your response to the free text answer for question number two. We'll put all of those an answers out after the webinar today is over. And you can see the results of the multi-select, uh, what parts of the draft guidance are folks interested in, with the leading part being verification and validation, 23 of the 56 responses that we received. Thank you very much, Paul. So everybody should have a flavor for how the polling works. We can advance to the next slide. So our first speaker of the day is Bakul Patel. Bakul is the Associate Director for Digital Health at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at CDRH at the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Mr. Patel leads regulatory policy and scientific efforts at the center in areas related to emerging and converging areas of medical devices, wireless, and information technology. This includes responsibilities for mobile health, health information technology, cybersecurity, medical device interoperability, and medical device software. So without further ado, but cool. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Next slide, Paul, please. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Can you guys hear me clearly? You sound great. Great. Thanks, Don. And hello, everybody. Uh, this is Bakul Patel, and thank you for the kind introduction, Don. Uh, on the eve of or the, on the footsteps of the draft guidance we published, I think this is a great opportunity for FDA to sort of share sort of the background on how the draft guidance came about rather than getting into guidance. So let me walk you through um, sort of what we, and I have only a few set of slides to sort of talk through. So next slide, please. The way I think about digital health and, and our interoperability is definitely part of digital health, where I think of digital health as a convergence of people, information, technology, and connectivity in healthcare, uh, with the promise that this, this world is gonna take us to a better safer and in a more efficient healthcare delivery system. And the connectivity, obviously, is a big piece of that puzzle. Next slide. Here's what we are, here's what we are shooting for from a digital health perspective and in a CDRH perspective is we want to head towards a place where uh, care is patient-centered. Uh, also from an FDA and a CDRH perspective, uh, we like to foster trust in innovation and technologies that enable the new healthcare paradigm. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is how can we prepare FDA and the industry for a digital future ready state where we can establish infrastructure, not only at, at CDRH, but also and create an ecosystem that will help uh, and help all of us advance 
of things like interoperability, cybersecurity, and other aspects that will lead to a better healthcare place. So with that, I'm, I'm going to jump right into interoperability, which is the key part of this, this puzzle. Next slide. So this slide, um, if people had attended the AME workshop in 2012, FDA AME workshop, I stole it from that slide deck. And it, in 2012, the benefits were still the same, and the opportunities were almost similar to what, where we are today. The way, what I wanted to predict in this slide in 2012 was interoperability is important. I think it has an opportunity to lower cost, create a best of breed coexistence, and also create smart in intervention. I'm more in interested in how we can get into smart intervention. If you think about that, it sort of creates an opportunity for you know, detecting errors that are before it actually happens, uh, avoiding uh, near misses, and creates a behavior for devices to, to operate safely. Um, it's not just about you know, devices and medical devices sending data to an EHR system, but it's more also about how can we come up with a system that will understand each component that are connected to each other, and how can we do that safely that will advance smart interventions. Next slide. So here's where we ended up. Um, we started started on this journey a long time ago, uh, way before I started joined FDA. But from what I can remember, um, there was a lot of discussions on interoperability, and a lot of people have been working on this. Many people, and including my colleagues who are going to be speaking right after me. But CDRH's goal and objective was to advance the role and ability of medical devices in a connected system to exchange and use information safely and effectively, not only with other information technology, but also with other medical devices. At the end of the day, we want to see safety increase and efficiency increase in patient care. I, I think this helps us sort of frame how we should be taking our role as a regulator, regulator and, and advance in this field of interoperability. So next time, let me just share the next slide, please. So, let me share with you sort of how we started on this journey. And when this journey began, uh, and Julian will probably remind me that it began in 2005, and yes, it was 2005. Um, but that was way before my time, and um, some of the records were not, not, I was not able to find. So I listed here something that I remembered. From 2010, in, on, in 2010, we had a three-day workshop. Phenomenal workshop, a lot of people came together and decided to work on inter medical device interoperability as a, as a big stakeholder community. A lot of work items came out of that. In 2012, we sort of revamped that and said, how can we make progress further to this? And we had a great two-day summit that FDA and Amy co-sponsored in, in understanding challenges. There was a paper that came out of that as well. In 2013, we took the findings from 2012 and 2010 workshop and said, FDA can sort of contribute in one way by saying there are some standards available in the space that will, that will enhance interoperability, and it may fit very well into a regulatory process. So we recognize, um, I believe, uh, roughly around 25 standards all in one shot, which means if you guys can imagine, reviewers need to look at the standards and understand what's in the standards, and recognition means uh, manufacturers can sort of implement those standards and and can can show conformance to those those concepts and the standards. Again, we wanted to promote um, industry-driven uh, best practices to interoperable solutions, and that this was our way of sort of uh, doing it by recognizing those standards. We continue to recognize standards, and we're looking for more standards to recognize that will drive a common understanding of what interoperability should look like. In 2015, we took another step by saying medical data system, device data systems um, is something that we would, we would not focus on enforcing our compliance actions towards, which with the intent of freeing up the data in medical devices, allowing manufacturers to create an ecosystem where uh, they can share information very freely um, with the very minimal regulatory oversight. So that leads us to where we are today. Next slide, please. The draft guidance, and I'm not, I purposely didn't want to put content from the draft guidance here, and hopefully that will tease out to uh, 
um, to the questions that you guys may ask, but really it comes down to four big things in the gui in guidance that you could, you could take a perspective on. And again, this is a draft guidance, so we are looking for comments that we hit the right areas, whether we can sharpen our pencil in some in areas that that's of most need to advance this, the, um, the world of interoperability. But really both boils down to we want makers of medical devices to design for interoperability. We want them to anticipate interoperable scenarios. And that doesn't mean just users, but also systems that they're going to connect into and how their how their products are going to be used. So this guidance has been written from a medical device perspective. Imagine yourself being the medical device and looking outside in a connected world. What should you be thinking about? So anticipating those interoperable scenarios is really what they're focusing on. Managing risk, uh, that includes verification, validation, anticipating you know, things that could go wrong, these things that should be taken into account, um, should be part, should be a key part of their whole process of designing and interoperability. And at the very, and not but the least, but is the last concept in the guidance, draft guidance is about transparency. We want folks to create either a standard phase, and that's why I talked a little bit about recognition of standards, or create a very transparent medical device interface that others, when they use it, know exactly what those interfaces are meant for. It also allows you to sort of understand the risk uh, and anticipate scenarios that you can technologically sort of in, implement in, your, in the products that uh, there are made so to manage the behavior. At the end of the day, you don't want a, pro, a, a medical device that an op behaves in an unintended fashion that could cause patient safety issues. On the same token, you don't want to, you want to have the medical device behave in a way that will advance the smarter healthcare intervention. So that's really where we started from. And we didn't jump to this conclusion uh, um, suddenly. I think it came through this, the evol evolution of in 2010 and even before that, sort of understanding patient needs and understanding sort of needs of the stakeholder community of how we can actually advance this. Think about this guidance as one piece of the puzzle for building the case for interoperability. And if you go to the next slide, Paul, um, I, can, I can share with you sort of how we, how we thought about it. I think it's important to understand uh, the patient needs, the safety needs, the business needs, the research needs, and the provider's needs to engage with them and sort of see what, what engagement should we bring to the table in terms of, um, terms of understanding and addressing some of the medical device interoperability advancements. This is what I call the case for interoperability, and I'm, I'm, I published a blog, um, you know, week, a couple of weeks ago, which talked about, I think this is a, a gesture from FTA doing our part in sort of understanding how, uh, what the needs are from a regulatory perspective, and engaging with stakeholders since 2010 and before that in 2005, and putting out through the, um, guidance as well as recognition of standards to advance the case of interoperability. So I, this is my call, and this is our call from FDA for everybody to sort of in, advance interoperability. So with the theme that I had in the blog, if you guys haven't noticed, um, if you go to the next slide, Paul, it, as Yura would say, you advance interoperability, how will? Hmm. Yes. Hmm. So I didn't actually mimic Yoda very well, but I want to leave this talk with you guys as we talk about today and think about these questions. And as you hear um, Ed and Julian talk through, I think it's important for us to think about how will we advance in interoperability together and what is needed to do that. So you can see the survey sort of yeah, hinting towards that. So appreciate your questions and thank you for your time. Paul, hand it back to Don. Great, thank you very much, Bakul. I appreciate that. Appreciate the great overview. We have the poll open, so please feel free, folks, as you listen to our speakers to fill in your answers to the poll. Additionally, we've received a few questions during Bakul's presentation, and we'll continue to collect those throughout the two next speakers. So please feel free to answer your, uh, ask your questions. 
And with that, we'll move on to our second speaker, Safe Medical Device Interoperability to Enable Healthcare Transformation, presented by Julian Goldman. Dr. Goldman is the Medical Director of Biomedical Engineering for Partners Healthcare, an anesthesiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, and Director of the Program on Medical Device Interoperability. This program was founded in 2004 to advance medical device interoperability to improve patient safety and health IT innovation. Dr. Goldman is a board certified in anesthesiology and clinical informatics and serves as a visiting scholar in the FDA Medical Device Fellowship Program, as well as an executive of a medical device company. At MHG, Dr. Goldman served as principal anesthesiologist in the OR of the Future, a multi-specialty OR that studies diverse technologies and clinical practices to enable broad adoption. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Goldman. Next slide, please, Paul. Uh, just let me confirm that you can hear me. Sounds great, Julian. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, at the, it's a, um, and thank you, Bakul, for laying the foundation. I'll try to build on some of the ideas that you proposed and uh, and cover uh, actually some wide-ranging topics. So the next slide will, let's see, ah, there we go. So as you mentioned, I'm an anesthesiologist by training and, and I'm not a youngster anymore, so I've been practicing for a long time. And if, for those of you on the phone and part of this meeting, many of you have experience in clinical areas. And if you were to look at a photo of an event in an OR, this is a photo of a patient who was hit by a car. We saved their lives, uh, that patient's life at MGH a number of years ago. If you look at this photo and you think back to what you've, the kind of, uh, the nature of clinical environments over time, you'd be hard pressed to see how they have changed in, in fundamental ways over the last few decades. Uh, we still look at that picture and you can see how many devices are used for administration of blood, infusion pumps, monitors in the back, and there's uh, someone standing in the center left of the photo who's manually entering information into the anesthesia EMR. And anesthesia, the specialty in anesthesia was the first to adopt EMRs uh, pervasively it, and has had the, uh, the most significant penetration of any clinical area for quite a while because of the need for real-time documentation. And the, the value has been understood for a long time. So if you look at these environments, you realize despite all the wonderful ideas people have to improve the safety of medication administration, fluid administration, vital signs monitoring, smart alarms, it's still, it's still very difficult to implement these things in these clinical environments. And when, the, when something bad happens or if we just want to assess adherence to protocols, uh, we don't have a, a black box recorder in a clinical environment that can record, record the data from all the medical devices as well as other information that's required for uh, rich contextual awareness. Uh, so, and that remains a longstanding challenge. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is, these are figures that are becoming increasingly well known. And uh, if you look at the CDC website, you can see that the, the top 10 causes of death in the U.S. are listed there. Heart disease and cancer is one and two. And if you, if you just insert what we know today about the deaths due to preventable medical errors in hospitals, somewhere between two and 400,000 deaths, would that, that would appear as number three on that list, the third leading cause of death in the U.S., enough to fill one Arlington Cemetery every year, and that's despite sending, spending 17% of our GDP on healthcare. Uh, so we need to make sure that the, whatever we're spending is being used to improve the quality of healthcare and uh, to decrease that number. Next slide, please. I'd like to take as an example use case or clinical scenario the idea of the patient-controlled analgesia or PCA and to illustrate the system challenges in improving the safety of PCA. And we don't know for certain, but it's thought that uh, up to six people per day in the U.S. are either seriously injured or, or killed as a result of mishaps with PCA. The PCA is used to administer a powerful opioid like morphine, which, can de which will depress respiration and lead to cardiac arrest if there's an overdose. The patient presses the button to receive a dose, and uh, someone else may press the button for the patient. That's called PCA by proxy. Or there could be a drug dosing error, a programming error, or whatnot. Now, 
we don't uh, nationally comprehensively monitor all these patients. We don't put pulse oximetry, capnography, blood pressure monitoring on every patient on a PCA because of the high false alarm rate. That's the whole issue with alarm fatigue and the imprecision of alarms in use today. It's very difficult to improve the quality of alarms in this kind of setting. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, and if we go back one slide, I'm sorry. You'll note that at the bottom of the slide, there's a URL to online animations that depict the challenges that occur and potential solutions of how we could improve safety uh, if we could integrate the monitors, integrate sensor data, and improve the reliability of the alarms. Next slide, please. <clears throat> well, we also know the alarm problem is vexing, and there are tens of thousands of alarms for hospitals per day, up to 99% of which are not, don't require intervention by a nurse, physician, or other person, which means they're non-actionable and they produce alarm fatigue. The screen capture on the right, the photo, shows an example on a medical monitor, which has a high priority alarm of asystole of cardiac arrest, even though uh, the patient is fine, as you can see from the blood pressure waveform. And it isn't that the manufacturer, in this case, doesn't know how to produce a smarter alarm. It shows the challenge that exists due to a number of things, from standards and regulations and a whole host of factors, that make it hard to implement and deliver those things. Next slide, please. So I use the PCA case, the patient-controlled analgesia uh, example, because it's an archetypal example. We know for a long time that these problems are occurring. It's, the literature is replete with examples. The websites are replete with, with, with just horrible stories from, from family members of, uh, their, of, of their loved ones who, who were injured or died. And yet, despite the calls to action, despite the fact that the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation called for the ability to be able to stop infusion pumps through an electronic interface, we still don't have the devices in the ecosystem functioning as good citizens that enable innovations to be easily implemented. So what we need are apps that can connect to sensors and actuators, devices that can be part of that ecosystem in a safe way, as Bakul pointed out. And we need open platforms, some means for contributions of algorithms and, and, and devices uh, from the community at large uh, to be able to contribute to smarter environments. And we need safe interoperability. The system has to be safe in the end. And, of course, that's challenging. And it also has to be able to support and improve patient safety. Next slide, please. Um, additional examples can also be found online. I won't spend time talking about these, but as I mentioned, just providing references. This is, uh, these are photos or illustrations from this month's Proto Magazine, which is available for free online. And it's entitled Babel in the ICU. And let's go through the next few slides. Let's go to the next slide. And that's a sedation use case, this chest imaging use case uh, on the next slide. Uh, this is a way that we could improve the safety of x-ray imaging by synchronizing ventilation and x-rays uh, to improve the quality of the images and improve the safety for the patient. There's been a lot of information and work on this by our team and collaborators over the years. Uh, next slide. And an example on improving care if there's a, if there's a brain injury. Uh, and the relationship between the head of the bed position and the intracranial pressure or other monitors. Uh, next slide. So these examples illustrate a concept here. You know, don't don't be uh, taken by the use of a smartphone in this example, but the notion of platform-based delivery of apps and intelligence, with the addition to add and remove different sensors and actuators in an appropriate manner. And notice that it isn't only applicable in an ICU or an OR. It could be important for care of patients in many other settings, including at home. Patients are on ventilators. They're on infusion pumps, dialysis. So there's high acuity care delivered in many environments in, we, in which we could improve the safety uh, and improve uh, the comfort for patients and all the other things that we know about. Next slide, please. The um, ECRI ECRI Institute um, 2015 top 10 health technology hazards listed these top 10 lists, as you could see. Number one, alarms. Number two, data integrity. All the way down, number five, ventilator disconnections that aren't caught and so forth. If we could start to integrate devices in the clinical environment in the manner that we touched on in the previous slides, it is easy to see how we could address and reduce uh, at least six of these top 10 hazards. And a num many people have looked at this list and some feel that we could reduce more, and that's fine. But the point is still made that through device and data integration and a means to enable uh, more effective integration, 
we could have a great impact on patient safety. Next slide, please. Now, what about the EHR as the, as the, as the platform? Is that the right way to get this work done? We've, we are a nation that has transitioned uh, to the EHR with significant federal support and private investments and uh, very, very active and busy, healthy community of, uh, but is that enough? Can that do the job? Um, do we, can we get the data required for big data analytics? Can we personalize treatment? Um, is it the right place for real-time clinical decision support? Well, let's take a look on the next slide. And the next slide, this is an example just to help with orientation. This shows pulse oximetry data going from a pulse oximeter into an EMR. This is an actual screen capture. And, you, and the area circled in red is a lower saturation value. We'll go to the next slide and see. And now it's just in a large view, and you can see that that oxygen sat value is low. So if we look at the EMR, that's the blue dot in the center of the dotted red circle. If we look at this EMR, we may wonder what kind of care, what should we do for this patient? Do they have an intermittent problem? Do they have sleep apnea? Do they need a further workup? Should they stay in the hospital? If it's a child, if it's an adult, it has all sorts of implications. And the really, what's really happening in this case, as we see on the next slide, the patient is fine. It's just a blood pressure cuff inflating on the same limb as the pulse oximeter. And the bottom three photos explain what happens. You can see on the bottom left photo that the baseline saturation is 96%. In the center bottom photo, the cuff, blood pressure cuff inflates, cuts off blood flow to the limb, so the very bottom green line flattens out. That's the plethysmogram from the finger, the photo, uh, uh, the signal from, from the uh, perfusion of the finger. You can see the pulsatility is gone. On the bottom right photo, you can see that now there is blood return to the finger as the cuff deflates, but there's a period of instability of measurement of the pulse oximeter. And it just so happens that during that period of instability is when the EMR captured the value and put it into the, uh, into the record. Next slide, please. Another example of a cuff inflating on the same arm is an invasive blood pressure monitor, an arterial line, and you can see that the pressure is 68 over 38, and that's the value that may go into the EMR when, in fact, the patient's blood pressure is normal. And if you look at the red tracing going across the center of the screen, on the left side, it's relatively flat because the cuff is, is inflated, and it becomes more pulsatile as you look towards the right as the cuff deflates. So we have these different parts that are working to take care of the patient, but they're not working effectively as a system to provide accurate data. Next slide. This is an example on the top left showing that the follow the blue arrow, the patient saturation dropped to 84%, and it was captured by the monitor, 84% at 207. In the EMR screen on the right, the blue ticks across the top show no oxygen desaturation because the event was a transient event and it wasn't caught by the system and put into the record. Next slide. So we just showed examples of the data from the patient as the first mile, if you, you, know, if you use that uh, analogy. And we also have to think about medical devices as being part of the last mile of data. The data, we have to go back, data has to go back to the devices in the care of the patient if we want to do important things such as closing the loop on care, assuring that devices are used in the proper manner for clinical care, um, and even consolidating all the data that are, is required for adverse event analysis. All those patients in the, I'm sorry, all the pumps in that photo are for use on one patient after cardiac surgery. This is not a storage closet, despite what it looks like. Next slide, please. So a bit about the work that we've been doing. We started our program on medical device interoperability in 2004 after a, another project here at Mass General that we had on the operating room of the future, where we had, it was a wonderful project that has helped to change OR care and innovation, we saw that there were many things that still couldn't be implemented or solved. So we've developed a vendor neutral laboratory over the years with about a million dollars of infrastructure of medical devices and networking technology, both production and research. And we've developed an open source platform for research purposes for use by manufacturers and others working on standards and interoperability, device integration. And it's at a URL, uh, openice.info. And we'll take a very brief look at that in a moment. Um, our funding has been primarily from federal agencies. Next slide, please. So I have a chronology slide. And Bakul alluded to this chronology. Our first kickoff meeting was in 04. Then the next meeting was at the FDA in 2004. And then there was a third meeting, and, and as you see from the list, a number of others. And I think what's very important is that in 2009, we helped work on the standard for physiologic closed-loop controllers 
uh, and that explicitly sets a foundation for distributed systems for closed loop control. And then that culminates, as you see in the January 2010 workshop, and I didn't include any additional chronology, but they, the URL at the bottom of this page includes the slides that were presented in January 2010, and that's a public, uh, publicly available source of information. Next slide, please. So advocacy has also been part of our program, and we have worked uh, with a, a number of collaborators so that the, the paragraph that you're reading from the American Medical Association is very closely, has very close wording to other paragraphs like this that have been endorsed by other medical societies, all listed here on the slide, including the Massachusetts Medical Society and the ASA. This was done, of course, to help move that ecosystem in the, in the direction that we know it has to go. Next slide, please. So also on a website, and here you can see the URL, uh, we've been working for, uh, since 2010, on a medical device interoperability safety working group to develop a pre-submission uh, to the FDA on an interoperable medical device system. And you can see that online as well, that pre-sub. It's already gone uh, through um, an additional cycle and that will soon be published in a journal describing uh, the details of that. It's also been made publicly available to help, again, to support the community. Next slide, please. The other uh, activity we've been involved in is developing uh, interoperable device procurement RFI and RFP language. We built it, based it on work that was done at Kaiser, and then with Kaiser Hopkins, the VA, and now the ASA uh, uh, and Partners Healthcare, we've uh, published a document called MD Fire. Now it's confusing because there's another FHIR fire, an HL7. Uh, this fire predated that, and it can be confusing, but this is also a document online, and the text is available for any, any hospitals to use. Next slide, please. So a bit about the Open ICE research platform that's available. I use the word ICE a lot in this presentation. ICE stands for the Integrated Clinical Environment, and it's a standard that was published in 2009 by the ASTM by ACM International as number F2 set. Well, we won't go through those numbers. Uh, and uh, is, is a high-level architecture, functional architecture for how to integrate devices and data in a patient-centric manner. Next slide, please. So we're going to flip over to the web for about 30 seconds, openice.info. And what you see, oh, hey, good work. What you see there, and anyone could go to openice.info, you're seeing live data streaming from our lab at Mass General Hospital um, using the open source software and open source hardware. Um, it can be used on computers and you can download the software. It's not a medical device. It's not written under a quality system. This is a research platform intended to help the community. And if you can scroll down, we'll see that there's a ventilator there as well. Uh, and this is, as I said, uh, mention is running live. The video is just to show the data source that's coming to you. And the internet these days is so fast, it's really amazing that you'll see data after perhaps a two-second delay all the way from here. Let's go back to the slides, please. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is, if you download Open Ice, this is the screen you would see. Next slide, please. And these are the number of uh, device adapters we've already written that are built in. These are open source as well. Next slide, please. And uh, an example of, of how to use something like this to improve safety is a demonstration we had a few months ago at the American Society of Anesthesiologists in which we ran open ice to look at data in real time, detect a cardiac arrest, and then show information to help a clinician treat the patient. And the reason I'm pointing this out is it didn't, we, we as a group didn't have to think and work on the, the uh, specific treatment protocols. We simply linked to a widely accepted source of information, the Stanford Emergency Manual. And, and this is an example of how we need to bring together elements of the ecosystem to get the work done more quickly and to build on what everyone is doing and not try to reinvent the wheel. Stanford did a great job with their decision support, support material. We were able to just point to that. But the, by using apps running on open ice, we're able to enhance vigilance to have a continuous monitoring scenario and, and no false alarms. Next slide, please. So the final project I want to mention is something we call the Clinical Scenario Repository Project. I think this would be of interest to MDIC members. Uh, the problem that we faced is it's very hard, to, very difficult to gather good ideas um, to serve as the foundational inputs to develop interoperable systems that can have an impact. And so we built a website with support from the DOD, 
Next slide, please. We call it Good Ideas for Patient Safety or a Clinical Scenario Repository. And this is just an example screen of how someone would go to the website and enter information, in this case, the, P the PCA safety interlock. It describes an event and it describes possible solutions, sources of harm, equipment, and so on and so forth. This is not intended as a reporting tool to meet regulatory requirements. It's intended as a tool to help us start to gather information from the community. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the work that we've done has also been to bring the community together to solve uh, problems such as, in this case, uh, how do we address the e Ebola um, concerns that were happening last year in October and November. And there's more information, again, on the website. There's a URL. And this became part of a, the Global City Teams Challenge out of NIST, where in, in this project, 20 organizations uh, came together over 20 days to produce, uh, and then it's culminating in a three-day hackathon, to produce examples of how we could improve patient safety and the safety of caregivers in Ebola. Um, next slide, please. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, the very, the vitally important support from the FDA in this endeavor. Uh, the FDA immediately responded to help us uh, to work with companies that were on site and to show their support for innovative initiatives to help address Ebola. Next slide, please. Um, finally, I'm going to conclude by mentioning that part of the outgrowth from the Ebola work was a demonstration that we needed a more effective means to connect with a community and share information to help develop environments that are safe, secure, and interoperable. And so the IEEE was able to help us host the ICE Alliance. Next slide, please. Uh, and the ICE Alliance, that show, this shows the virtuous cycle of stakeholders that's necessary where manufacturers and standards development organizations, HDOs and researchers can share information in order to uh, address those needs for safety, security, and interoperability. And the next slide provides a specific example related to pulse oximetry. So we've had a project for several years in our program called MDIDS, Medical Device Interface Data Sheets. Think of it like material safety, da safety data sheets where we can start as a community to identify all the desired goes intos and goes out of for medical devices. And here's how that need for that information maps across the community, where standards development organizations can now have a consolidated set of information to ensure the standards are aligned. Manufacturers can provide input in terms of what they uh, need to implement or what they think we should be using as inputs and outputs, and they have the time to modify devices to meet the needs of healthcare delivery organizations and researchers, and note researchers are called out separately because of the different timeline, um, since research, of course, is different than widespread adoption. So this project called MDIDS is the kind of thing that we, from our program, are, are providing into the ICE Alliance. And I think, let's go up, maybe the last slide, I don't recall. Ah, yes, this is the last slide. It's essentially uh, a call to action. Uh, we as a community need to bump medical errors from the top 10 list and move it down to number 11. Uh, lower would be better, but this would be an order of magnitude reduction with a dramatic um, implications for, for patients and their families um, in, in our country. And lets us, uh, it'll help us set a leadership position uh, to show what can be done in healthcare. So that's it, thank you very much, Ron. I think that's the last slide. Wonderful, thank you very much, Julian. That was an excellent presentation. and. Several, several intriguing concepts presented within that, so thank you very much. I'll remind the audience that um, we'll take question and answers at the end, so feel free to type in your questions uh, from, for Julian in the Q&A box, and we'll answer those toward the end of today's presentation. And with that, we'll introduce our next speaker, rounding out our three speakers today, Mr. Ed Cantwell talking about an overview of the Center for Medical Device Interoperability. Mr. Cantwell is the Executive Director at the Center for Medical Device Interoperability, and the Center seeks to provide better health care for patients by advancing the safety, efficiency, and affordability of U.S. health care delivery. The mission of this Center is to serve as a focal point for hospitals and health care systems to drive rapid, widespread, sustained interoperability of medical technology. And with that, Ed, thank you very much. Paul, next slide. Thank you, Don, and thanks to Bakul and Dr. Goldman for setting such an appropriate stage. I'm going to come at it with a little different twist 
while Bakul paves the way for regulatory uh, ability to adopt interoperability system-wide, and Dr. Goldman has done some extraordinary research on the clinical aspects, I'm going to address a push to bring the voice of procurement to really drive transformation. Next slide. Uh, Josh, showing this slide after uh, Dr. Goldman uh, is a little bit repetitive, but let me talk to it through a different lens. Uh, as an ex-military pilot, um, when I look at this slide, I, I call it the cockpit equivalent. And it's, and the, the reason I do so is to challenge both the cost and the complex uh, interoperability challenge of each of the modalities in this room. And I think we all agree that today, not only uh, is there a lack of interoperability that leads to medical errors, but the high cost, both capital cost and recurring cost in maintaining these systems is not sustainable. So the center, like Bakul and Dr. Goldman, is really trying to, to uh, figure out an approach to address this issue. Next. The Center for Medical Interoperability was formed in August of 2013. It was incubated in the Gary and Mary West uh, Health Institute in La Jolla, California. And I must say that we had the benefit of working closely with Bakul and Dr. Goldman as we designed the center. So our vision is very consistent. We believe ultimately that data should become a commodity and made available to, to uh, the ecosystem when and where needed. Where we differ is in our governance. We feel that in order to uh, achieve system-wide interoperability, that the healthcare organizations need to come together like companies in every other vertical market came together and to cooperate to compel change. They did so by agreeing to fund through a nonprofit initiative what we refer to as a centralized lab, where some of these complex challenges in research can be integrated and used to develop actual solutions that are actually procured by the companies that need the solutions. So we are off to build a centralized lab to be the champion for plug and play interoperability, and back that by also performing the test and certification at the system level. Next. In order to, and this is just our, our core belief, in order to change the way that healthcare behaves, the health systems that procure medical devices and enterprise systems must, must be the driver to the change. So we set off to build a board of directors and founding members that represented the for-profit space, the nonprofit, and the public systems. We also know that we need enough raw procurement power so that the vendor community can, with confidence, tailor their R&D and tailor their solutions to what ultimately will be procured. It does no good for the vendor community to develop solutions when there's no clear path to actually being procured by a hospital system. So we represent now about one in, in every eight dollars procured and we're off to a good start. We're, we're adding members um, as we go. And ultimately, we hope that the center, as a 
hospital and health system led initiatives. We do not include vendors as members because we really want to be uh, the voice of the procurement side. We work closely with the entire ecosystem, but we want the health systems to step up and play their role in this transformation. Next. For each CEO that sits on our board of directors, we also have a technology focal point. And the way the center works is the CEOs provide the overarching strategic guidance, and then the Technology Advisory Committee fine-tunes fine -tunes the technical focus and prioritization of the resources within the center. We're a member dues-driven uh, organization. We're on a path uh, to about a $30 million run rate after about the fourth or fifth year in operation. And we feel that can put enough resources in place to both do cooperative R&D as well as test and certification. Next. Our, our belief is that in order to get to the innovation and transformation that Dr. Goldman so beautifully describes, the infrastructure must support it. In every other vertical market where the connected ecosystem is the underlying framework for business innovation and transformation, there is very clear guidance as to what an interoperability platform is, and there's a very clear path to uh, having a vendor put forth their solution in a way where it can be tested and certified. So uh, we are off, we'll have by about mid-year, we'll have the actual Center for Medical Interoperability facility that will uh, be the focal point for R&D uh, test and certification and being able to allow the vendors to bring their solutions to demonstrate that they are indeed uh, interoperable with the platform. Next. So the first um, priority for the center, as provided by our board and our technology advisory committee, is to uh, understand from the capture of data at the bottom to the enterprise system at the top. This slide depicts pervasively in a macro way the realization that uh, today there is a pervasively proprietary interfaces uh, between medical devices into some middle gateway or middleware up to the electronic medical record or other clinical apps or data research. Our view, uh, as shared by uh, Bakul and Dr. Goldman, next slide, is the desire to create a, what we call a plug and play interoperability platform that allows trust to be established between the medical or wellness devices at the point of care uh, through uh, and to include the EHR and clinical ap applications layer. If you uh, study most every other connected vertical market, you will find that they have an agreed upon and policed and maintained ability to do that. The example I give is if you have an internet appliance and you don't have a trusted internet, then you have a failed ecosystem. So the first priority for the center is the development of what we call a plug and play interoperability platform reference architecture. Very similar to the cable industry, whose cable labs is, is their centralized lab equivalent. They came together, they agreed on what's called a DOCSIS, which is the reference architecture the vendors built to in the cable modem, and it's created probably the biggest plug and play interoperability platform uh, in the world. Next. So we are off. Uh, to, we are off and uh, will be announcing shortly a coalition of 
uh, solution providers to help us come together, identify a plug and play interoperability reference architecture. The center then will be a physical resource for that reference architecture to support reference implementations from the solution uh, ecosystem. And then a clear agreed upon path to test and certification. That will then allow our members the confidence uh, to procure such a system, plus the confidence that over the life cycle of the platform, there's, there's a dedicated resource to maintain it. We'll also be forming a coalition with the medical device uh, community to make sure that the relationship between the platform and the devices are, is, is synergistic and that the needs of the platform and the needs of the devices are, are clearly understood. We'll then look north to have relationships with the electronic uh, health record community plus the non-EHR value-added clinical applications. And we're, we're really excited about the ability for this platform to enrich research and data analytics. So, but the point, the key point for this presentation is we want to be very, very focused up front that unless the millions and millions of devices have a trusted platform to it, for which to be interoperable with, then we're going to see uh, more behavior of wanting to protect the information and keep it proprietary. So we hope by playing the role in the manner in the middle, we, we can enable what Pakul and Dr. Goldman mentioned. Next. We also realize that this is one complex beast, and everybody has a slightly different definition of what interoperable is. So we have begun uh, working on a concept of, of a maturity model that laces what we call the five dimensions of interoperability, and that is the infrastructure must support it, must have syntactic interoperability, semantic, which then allows you to have conversational uh, complexity, then you know the holy grail of being able to uh, support the smart intervention, uh, as Bakul mentioned. We also realize that uh, because this is a system of system challenge, you have to participate and you have to, to piece all five of these dimensions together. And there's a realization that you could be from the most basic to the most advanced. So we'll use this model to keep us honest and to uh, hopefully a tool to assess the level of interoperability, whether you be a device a device in a system or a software platform. Next. So, in, in essence, uh, we we hope to uh, we hope to be the force in the market that will actually motivate people to want to build to this interoperable vision we have, and uh, you know we 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 kill between one and two 747 crashes a day. And I think that if you continue to buy the same way, you're going to continue to buy or continue to get the same result. So we hope this is a more of a market-driven and close coordination with the government and the vendor ecosystem and other well-intended uh, associations and nonprofits. We hope to play a role. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. That was a really great way to sort of bookend the presentation today. So I want to remind the audience that we're going to begin the question and answer period now. There is a Q&A button in the top right-hand corner, which will open a panel where you can ask questions. And we'll facilitate those questions with the panel. I'll ask the panel these questions. So we have some to begin with. Please do add to these questions. It'll help with the interactivity. 
And then also we had the, the polling activity. So at this point in time, we're going to close the poll so that everybody can see the results. So we'll give it just one more quick, so oh, great job there, Paul. And if Paul will go ahead and expose those uh, results to everybody so that we can kind of use the responses that we received from the crowd to help drive some of our Q&A. So in a minute, the polling results will display. Oh, fantastic. So we had a total of eight questions. And it looks like um, probably home health and mobile were the two device classes that we saw needing the most interoperability. The biggest pain point in implementing interoperability was around a lack of an implemented infrastructure and difficulty implementing the standard. It looks like folks strongly agree that interoperability is an important question. We can all learn from the, uh, the DICOM experience, it looks like. And for example, it looks like folks are at the end, it looks like we're at kind of an opposite ends of spectrums with regards to some of our um, industry partners planning are currently interoperable and then at the other end of the stream, not very interoperable. And in the future, we seem to want to aim more towards that interoperability framework. So directionally, that's very encouraging. We'll release more of the free text answers later after the seminar on our MDICX webpage. And now we'll go ahead and start with the, the Q&A. So Bakul, I'll start with you. Within the FDA, how broadly accepted are the concepts within the draft guidance, meaning within CDRH, including reviewer level, registration and listing, et cetera, across the various centers? So, I mean, it's almost a gimme question, but I'll answer it anyways. It's an easy one because the guidance was written by staff and there's a working group that worked from several offices on the draft guidance and part of our our guidance clearance process, the center offices clear the guidance before it actually publishes. So uh, I would say um, the, the offices are aware of this draft guidance and when we finalize it, it goes through more clearances after based on the feedback we get from, from the public. Great, thanks. I did have a follow-on question to that. Uh, for those of us who may not be familiar, could you um, explain a bit about how the guidance is informed by comments, what that period is, and then what the timeline um, is expected to be between draft guidance and, and the and final guidance? Yeah, so definitely I can answer, I can take that on. I get, I get that a lot as well. Then we publish just to share sort of the process, how it works. We put this, we put this draft guidance as a proposal of our current thinking. Um, uh, and most recently, we said we'll, I mean, before we, when we put the guidance up, we said we'll open the common period for 60 days. Um, right now, uh, we have extended the, uh, the common period to April 28th, or yeah, April 28th, uh, uh, 2016, to, for, for folks to comment on. Um, so that's 90 days from the day, from the day it was published. Once we get those comments, it takes down um, everybody in the center to sort of look at what the comments are, and depending on the amount and the number of comments and the type of comments, we process it, and then we have to work through uh, all the nuances and have come up with a balance of where uh, where the final guidance should 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 be drafted and how it should be drafted. That process can take anywhere from you know six months to um, to, to about a year, at least in my mind, to sort of depending on what kind of guidances and guidances or what kind of comments we get back. Um, in my experience, the, when it's a very complicated topic, it takes it takes a long time for us to sort of settle down on um, on direction and also taking in taking into account implications and probably um, towards towards the previous question that was asked is is everybody in the center. 
aware of what, what we are proposing. Um, it would be really important for us to make sure that the comments are, uh, are considered and given equal, given weight enough to, for us to make those decisions. So it, it, I'm not giving you a time frame, and it's hard for me to give you a time frame, but it all depends on the, the type of comments and the, and the issues that are raised as a result of comments. Great. Thank you very much, Bakul. Um, there was a, a question about timing, and I think that it's probably, it, it's very relevant uh, both to the answer you just gave, Bakul, but also with um, what Ed is proposing. So, Ed, I'll direct this question to you. Um, the question is, with all due respect, progress to date, we have been far too slow in our success. What can hurry up our savings of patients? Well, the, the strongest force to accelerate change is an actual procurement. Um, you know, Dr. Goldman put on his you know, list of deaths the goal to reduce preventable deaths. Uh, the patient safety movement has a goal of zero preventable deaths by 2020. So in our view, unless the hospitals and health systems commit to adopting the platform, and, and I use platform in a generic way here to encompass all of the desires of what you heard today, then I, I don't think the entropy of the ecosystem is going to magically come together and start fixing. So we think the first set of procurements, or perhaps kind of a moonshot goal of by the you know end of uh, 2017, you know these modalities will be expected to be fully interoperable against a publish and open reference architecture uh, that enables it. So I, I think from a timing point of view, you know, the, the analogy I get is if you were walking into your office every day to try to solve it and you watched one of those 747s crash every day as you walked into the office, you know, what sense of urgency would you have? So we're trying to use the power of the dollar to create the sense of urgency. And Ed, I had a follow-up question to that one. Uh, what time of time frames is your organization working towards? You touched a little bit on the present in, on it in the presentation, um, but I was wondering if you could expand just a bit. That's yeah, a great question, and, and it's the true challenge. We we have a, a, a saying that we use: two plus five years. Uh, very aggressive precision within the next two, and then directionally uh, straight at the next five. So we we hope within the next two year period to have developed a reference architecture, made it available to the ecosystem, made the the centers lab available to that ecosystem to do support reference implementations and then start a test and certification so that by the end of this two-year period, our members, which are the hospitals and health system, can actually start to procure. And it could be uh, adopting the reference architecture themselves or partnering with, with the vendors in the coalition to integrate that platform into the health system. I do believe that uh, we must, we just must, within the two to four year period, start getting this platform deployed into the health system. Great, thank you. Julian, I'm gonna direct the next question to you. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, and I'll, I'll give you two questions in, in one ask here. Um, the MD idea sounds very interesting and the analogies to the MSDS sheet seem really clear. What responses have you had to this type of an idea? And as you think about where it can be applied, uh, a lot of the examples that you gave in your presentation were in the OR, acute needs for interoperability. Are there examples for the need for interoperability in more chronic situations? Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's a very good question. The examples 
in, in a sense, the reason for focusing our energy in high acuity, remember, it's not the physical OR, it's just high acuity clinical scenarios. Because if we figure out how to address the, the regulatory um, science questions, the ways to assure safety of, of interoperable systems, and uh, the things that, for example, we included in the pre-submission, um, as we start to tease that out, as we started to tease that out, it, it reveals things that are required for a system to be safe. For example, if you manufacture a pulse oximeter that's used at home, if you manufacture one that's used in the hospital, there are many things that are similar between those. In both cases, we need the data from those devices not only to conform to standards, but we have to ensure that if you pull data from the device, it doesn't harm the device itself. And that might, might sound trivial or unnecessary to even think about, but the fact is that there are uh, many examples, and companies who develop middleware have shared with us their examples of problems that occur when they connect middleware to devices and start to pull data. Uh, we've had a case in our lab where simply by pulling data from a, a ventilator, it caused the ventilator to shut down and reboot and stop ventilating. But there are many other problems that can occur. So, so these needs are not unique in the hospital or high acuity. It's really important that across the ecosystem uh, for that. And it's why we need to have device models, a, a model that describes all the goes intos and goes out ofs and behaviors of a device. For example, if you're connecting to a blood pressure cuff, even at home for a telemedicine application, you need to know whether that value is a new value or an old value. Is it from yesterday, two days ago, or five minutes ago? Or is it from an hour ago when the patient was at home lying in bed? Or was it when they sat in a chair and they started getting dizzy? Well, how do you know that? Uh, so one problem is that we don't have accurate clock times on medical devices, and we studied 2,000 medical devices in five hospitals. About 5% of them have the correct clock time. Most of them don't for a variety of reasons. So uh, I, I think the problem is, you know, we shouldn't assume that because the examples are high acuity in a hospital that it doesn't apply to the whole ecosystem. Um, the MDIDs, the medical device interface data sheets, are, uh, the question was how are those you know, what's the interest in those? And I would say there's very broad interest. In fact, the interest is greater than our ability to support uh, the, the project. Uh, we've been fortunate to have this research funded, uh, in this case, and by a number of agencies. Uh, but the, what we hear from manufacturers is we need that. We need, we need to understand why some people ask for waveforms from a pulse oximeter and others don't care. And all of that needs to be documented in, in a tool like this. So that's, so the interest is very high uh, without question. And I think this gets back to the question uh, that you asked, Ed, and uh, that I'd like to comment on, which is one of the problems that we have is a lack of, of a common or shared understanding of the need. Different manufacturers get different stories from different customers. The FDA hears only about a small subset of patient injuries especially when they involve a, a faulty medical device or a perceived problem with the device. And I would say that the, the, the gap that we have to drive these changes and allow the market to produce solutions is the lack of any common reporting pathway, uh, any consistent reporting for the problems that we have related to lack of interoperability. And, and in part, we try to touch on that with the project on the clinical scenario repository or good ideas for patient safety. But you know, ours is a pilot project. It isn't a, a national solution. And I think that's sorely needed so that we have a convergence in our national agenda uh, to improve healthcare safety. Thank you, Julian. I'm going to go off script here. And, and uh, you brought up an interesting topic. Bakul, would you be interested in um, uh, talking a little bit about the FDA strategic priorities, specifically the national device evaluation system and the concepts of how interoperability might be um, important in that framework. I think I think there's a great segue into, into what um, what Julian was talking about in terms of you know the national evaluation system is basically focused on understanding what how devices behave uh, in real life. And then creating this data, this concept of data commons that are information commons that can, that can exist in various spots and can be pulled together not only to advance regulatory science 
and you know, taking information like Joanne has researched on and, and Ed has uh, figured out and sort of needs uh, from, the, uh, from the buyer's perspective, how can we bring that together and enhance uh, the, the decision making and also um, from, from an FTA perspective, but also from a, from a stakeholder perspective, understanding what the needs are. So the concept at a very high level that sort of gels into sort of understanding what the needs are it, that includes reporting, that includes in the post market uh, studies, it includes sort of real life experience, patient preference, et cetera, would, would fit into that. So that's how I see the, the evaluation, evaluation system sort of feeding in and tie, tying in with the interoperability goal of objectives that we have sort of started. Great. Thank you, Bakul. So I have a, a couple of questions that I think maybe are best answered as a panel exploration. So there are um, three questions that I'll bundle together and then I'll let you um, respond to them and maybe we can go in the same order as the presenters, Bakul, Julian, and Ed. Um, the three questions are, what consensus standards have been adopted as a, response, as a result of interoperability initiatives? Um, the second then is, what are the impediments to developing and rolling out platforms? And gosh, why don't we have them yet? Uh, and so the, the last one is, I know intended use is very important. What should we do is really that first step? Is there a scenario or a risk analysis What's that first step? So it's those three questions around standards, impediments to platforms, and how do we start? Bukul, we'll start with you. Sure, thanks, Don. So tall order here. So I'll tell you the easy one. Uh, from FTA's perspective, there are standards we recognize um, as part of the 11073 family, the 80,000 family, which is on the website, on FTA's website of recognized standards. Um, I did not include a link, but I'm happy to share the link to, with you, Don, and you can share with uh, with others. Might be useful for us to sort of others to sort of see the set of interoperability standards that we are looking at. That's number one. Number two is about about you know what is stopping us from um, from rolling out platforms. I think I think it's it's a large large order for platforms to sort of come about. I mean, you can think you can think about how Julian has been working on and creating this ICE platform for a, while, for a long time. And, and that is just an instantiation of a concept that the ICE, uh, ICE work, work that Julian has done to, to make, make sure the systems are, are safe. And then you sort of look at it from a different perspective of a bias perspective and see what Ed has done. I believe there are other, other work, there is other work that's, that's sort of been created and have been created at a different levels in terms of platform. It's, to me, um, when, we, when we think about, when I think about interoperability, it's not just about in a healthcare institution, but it's also at the personal level. So you have personal connected devices at home that, that also need the platform of some, some kind. And I'm not sure whether we know where all those platforms are. So I can add, from my perspective, it's hard for me to, I know of two or three, large platforms and efforts that are underway. But I think there are other, I suspect there are other activities going on that we, we don't have a clear understanding of where those are. And it would be great for us to sort of this community to sort of figure out where those platforms are and what suits best for each application and how can we leverage them. So that would be my second response, my second to so the second answer. And you talked about intended use. Yes, intended use from, F, from an FTA perspective is very important. It sort of sets out, um, you know, at a very high level, philosophical level, is what does what is what are you intending the product to do? So when I go back to my um, my slide about what the draft guidance is trying to do is is to convey the message that you need to fi uh, the manufacturers need to figure out what interoperability would mean for their products and design those in and then consider how it's going to be used. So that should be part of that, and it should be part of the risk analysis that happens as well. So I think I think it's it is part of bread and butter that that many medical device manufacturers do today. We are saying that interoperability should not be forgotten 
as and similar to how cybersecurity should not be forgotten along with that. So I wanted to sort of, that would be my way of thinking that how we bring that in the concept of creating intended use and in the concept of creating the device itself. So I'll stop there and that was purely from a uh, FDA perspective. I'm sure Julian and Ed has, have different, different ideas. Thanks, Bakul. So, so Julian, I'll hand it over to you. And the, the three topics were um, standards, you know, what, what really standards can be pointed to from these interoperability initiatives? What are the barriers to platform adoption? And if we think about really first steps, intended use is important, but, but where can we really start? Um, I'll hand it over to you for some thoughts on that. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Don. Great questions, uh, and you know each of these, of course, is a good subject for a day, but, you know, a day-long discussion. Uh, keep it short. So standards. First of all, the FDA has done a, a very nice job in recognizing standards that are important for interoperability, and they are on the FDA website, as as Bakul mentioned. The standards are somewhat incomplete, and standards are often that way until you have things that are built and functioning and running, and then you find out that there are gaps in the standards and you have a chance to fix them. But it has been a bit of a, of a chicken and egg problem in that a lot of standards are written only after you figure out how to solve a problem and you have things that are working and running. Using a standard to convey a vision is generally not done, and so it's inherently challenging to do this. But there are standards that have been adopted. A number of, and I'll, I'll add that Interoperability requires, you know, two things. It takes two to tango in interoperability. It takes a lock and a key. So uh, you need to change medical device standards so that their interfaces will, will work with whatever they're connecting to. And you also have to change uh, where they're going. So towards that end, we started a, a, all the way back in around 2006 working on changing standards. So the first, one of the first was the change in the closed loop control standard that I mentioned previously, IEC 60601-1-10, to allow for devices to be uh, distributed in a system. And then we helped uh, to create the ICE standard, F2761, in 09, and those have been recognized by the FDA. We then also helped to change the standards for pulse oximetry, CPAP machines, and I say we as a community, not uh, you know, not necessarily my team over here, but we, the the community of interest that wants this to happen. Um, pulse oximetry is being changed most recently, and that's being chaired by someone from the FDA, uh, Dr. Sandy Weininger. We also have CPAP machines. We have uh, um, changes in ventilators, both for anesthesia use as well as for the ICU. All of these require changes to the standards. Um, so there's a lot, and of course, there's a whole family of IEEE standards that have been evolving and HL7. What are the barriers to adoption? Well, it gets a little bit back to the notion of how do we assure that we're going to deliver what's needed? So we, we're expecting the community to rally around a solution, but a lot of the members of, this, of the community writ large don't know whether it's going to help them in their products or help them in their patients or solve problems or introduce new problems or just create additional um, competitive barriers. So it isn't clear to everyone, and the MDIDS is one of those projects that's intended to have a shared repository of information so that everyone can transparently see what the impact would be of, of implementing a capability. Uh, we also don't yet have uh, good and complete models for devices and their behavior. So if you're trying to have a smart algorithm and you say, what's the blood pressure now, and you try to read the blood pressure, you have to know that when you trigger a blood pressure cuff, it may require a few tries or take a few minutes to give you a number. So you have to have a way of describing a device's behavior in a model. A lot of that work hasn't been done yet. And, and I'll take all of this towards, again, the need to have a better shared uh, concept nationally of what we're trying to achieve with these specific examples of interoperability. When it's vague, we don't have changes in the marketplace and standards organizations don't know which gaps need to be filled, the more imprecise this is, the harder it is to see a, a realization of the vision. Great. Thank you, Julian. So, Ed, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. The three questions are, what, you know, key standards have arisen from this interoperability initiative? Uh, what are the barriers to platform adoption? And if we really want to start, what are some key first steps? 
So as it relates to standards, uh, there is some extraordinary good work being done across the board on standards, but a thousand standards won't magically morph into a executable or deployable platform. And we must admit that the consensus, the legal consensus process that drives the standards body can be used as an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon. So if you study almost every other vertical market that came up with a complex, one-to-many, two-way, plug-and-play, standards-based, and trusted platform, they did so by having a de facto standard, which then morphed into a standard which allowed the thousands of different point standards to have context. So from a barrier point of view, boy, you know, I, I see the biggest barriers as our hospitals and health systems have their hands full. You know, their their day-to-day -day job is so complex and the environment is changing so fast, is we're asking them to redesign the airplane while they're flying. So I think we just have not established enough sustainable centralized cooperative R&D force to help them reinvent their own vertical market. And, and, and as you can see, the center's tried to, to address that. On where to start, I, I, think, I think Dr. Goldman nailed it. Uh, we are going to start where care is most acute, where we kill the most people accidentally, and where the costs are high. And we feel if we engage at that point, we will deal with about 90% of the ecosystem that will take that wonderful technology and push it outside the hospital for a truly connected health system. Thanks. Great, Ed. That's a fantastic summary. So we have, we've reached the end of the hour. There are a handful of questions that I didn't get to. Um, so I apologize if yours were one of them. Thank you very much to our, our speakers today, Bakul, Ed, and Julian. I think this was a wonderful dialogue. We will make the video available on our MDICX website, as well as results from the survey. We'll send an email to everybody when that becomes available. And our speakers have provided a series of web links and other content that we'll make available on that same web page so that you can find some of the great content that was discussed here. I want to thank everybody today and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.